In this video, we're going to look at evaluating double integrals using polar coordinates. So let's take a few minutes to review polar coordinates. So if I have a point P in the plane, we know that, of course, we can use Cartesian or rectangular coordinates. And that's just going to be the x coordinate and the y coordinate. Polar coordinates, we have two coordinates as well. The first coordinate, r, is the sine distance from the origin to point p. Now, sine distance means that really we could have a negative value for r. What that means is that theta, in a sense, gives you the direction that you want to go. And then a positive r would mean you'd go along the ray that forms theta, the angle theta. But a negative r would mean you would go in the opposite direction. So parallel to that ray, starting from the origin, but go in the opposite direction of the ray, the distance r. So this point, capital R, down here has coordinates negative r comma theta. So the ray that makes the angle theta with the positive x-axis here uh, is parallel to the ray that goes down to r, uh, the point r, but in the opposite direction. Now the angle theta is measured counterclockwise from the polar axis. So positive angles would move in the counterclockwise. That's the usual way. Uh, the polar axis is really just the positive x-axis. So we call the origin the pole and the positive x-axis is called the polar axis. Uh, theta can also be negative. So our point S here has coordinates negative theta comma R. So how do we convert back and forth? Well, uh, we know that uh, X squared plus Y squared would be R squared, X and Y being the X and Y coordinate of the point. So x equals r cosine of theta, y equals r sine of theta, and then tangent of theta is y over x. Now, we have to be really careful when using uh, polar coordinates. You really have to be focused. You have to take your time. And one of the issues is that the polar coordinates of a point are not unique. So here I have a point Q. And there's many ways that we could write the polar coordinates for Q. In fact, there's infinitely many ways we could do it. So for example, um, the angle made with the positive x-axis is negative pi over 4 radians. So I could write it as negative pi over 4. And then the distance from the origin down here, well, it's a 45, 45, 90 triangle. So it's just square root of two times the length of the side, which is three. So three square root of two. So one set of polar coordinates would be negative pi over four comma three square root of two. But of course I could have gone counterclockwise 7 pi over 4 radians and kept the same r value. So another pair of polar coordinates for the same point would be 7 pi over 4 comma 3 radical 2. Now instead of going all the way around I could have just gone opposite of the ray to q which would be 3 pi over 4 radians and then used a negative r value. So a third set of polar coordinates for the point q would be 3 pi over 4, negative 3, radical 2. And of course, 
I can go around the uh, pole there as many times as I want. And I would just add a multiple of two pi. So I could go around once, which would be two pi, and then go around another seven pi over four, making a total of 15 pi over four, and keeping r three radical two. So a fourth set of polar coordinates for the point Q would be 15 pi over four, comma three radical two. So in general, the most general formula for the polar coordinates for Q is that you can either have a positive R value of three radical two, and then you would take negative pi over four and add any multiple of two pi to it. K is an integer in these formulas. Or you could have a negative R value, in which case you would take three pi over four and add any uh, integer multiple of two pi. All right, so let's review also the area of a sector of a circle. The sector of a circle is just a wedge or a fraction of a circle with a central angle of theta. The radius is r and the area is one half theta r squared. Now, it's, of course, good to have this memorized, but if you ever forget, it really does make sense. A sector is just a fraction of a circle. It's just a piece of pi, if you want to think of it that way. And so the you can set up a proportion, the area of the sector over the area of the entire circle should be proportional to the central angle over 2 pi, because there's 2 pi radians. Of course, your center angle has to be measured in radians. And so we know that the area of a circle is pi r squared. So if we solve this proportion, then for the area of the sector, we get our formula that the area of the sector is 1 half theta r squared. And theta has to be measured in radians. Radians. All right, so how, how is that going to help us with our double integrals? Well, we need to be able to figure out our area differential dA. In polar coordinates, dA is just, I mean polar. In rectangular coordinates, dA is just dx times dy or dy times dx. What is it going to be in polar coordinates? Well, we're going to take a region, and here I have a polar grid. And so what I'm going to do is make a mesh on my region here. And forgive my drawing, it's not exact, but the idea is that every one of these little sectors here, as I fan out across the region, should have a central angle of delta theta, which would be my first angle, alpha, and my last angle, beta, so I take beta minus alpha and divide it up by n. And then I would do the same thing with the uh, radius here. I would take the smallest radius, subtract it from the largest radius, and divide that by n, and that will give me a delta r. And so I get this mesh of uh, polar cells across the region. And so as n goes to infinity, of course, uh, the area, which is my delta A, is going to become my differential dA. So how do I calculate the area of just one of these little cells? Well, really, it's just the area of this big yellow uh, sector minus this smaller blue sector. And so uh, the only thing that differs, both have a central angle of delta theta, but uh, one, the blue one, has the smaller radius r sub i minus one, and the uh, yellow one has the bigger radius at r sub i. So I would just take half 
r sub i squared delta theta and subtract off half r sub i minus 1 squared delta theta, and that would give me the area of this cell. So let's do some algebra with that. Let's factor out the 1 half in front and the delta theta on the right. And I'm left with the difference of two squares, which I'll factor as r sub i plus r sub i minus 1, and times r sub i minus r sub i minus 1. Now, this first factor, 1 half r sub i plus r sub i minus 1, that would just be the average of those two uh, radii. I'm going to call that my sample radius r sub i star. And then the difference between r sub i and r sub i minus 1 is just my delta r. So really, the area of this single cell uh, is just going to be, well, my sample radius, r sub i star, times delta r, times delta theta. So as the number of cells goes to infinity, uh, r sub i star is just going to become r, delta r will become dr, delta theta becomes d theta. And so my differential for polar coordinates is r dr d theta. So if I have a polar rectangle, what does that mean? Well, we call it a polar rectangle because we're saying the bounds on both r and theta are constants. They're just constant numbers. And a lot of important and common regions are polar rectangles, a full circle, a half circle, a washer, half a washer, a quarter circle. Those are all polar rectangles. So in general, what does it look like? Well, you have an inner radius and an outer radius. You have an initial angle alpha and a final angle beta. So it could be that the uh, initial radius is zero, in which case you would just get a sector of a circle. And the uh, initial angle could be zero, let's just say going to pi, that would give me half a circle, and so on. So now let's figure out what the, uh, how I would evaluate a double integral. Well, I have a function of x and y over a region, which is you know something like a polar rectangle. Then we would evaluate it as follows. We would replace the dA with the r dr th d theta. Then we would convert our formula for the integrand to polar coordinates. So we'd use x equals r cosine theta y equals r sine theta, x squared plus y squared equals r squared, whatever we need to convert it into polar coordinates. And then our bounds of integration for r are just from a to b, that's the inner radius and the outer radius. And the uh, bounds for theta are just the initial angle and the final angle. So let's look at an example. We're going to evaluate 3x plus 4y squared dA, where r is the region in the upper half plane bounded by the two circles, x squared plus y squared equals 1, and x squared plus y squared equals 4. So that is half of a washer or annulus. The inner radius is 1, the outer radius is 2. We're only taking the upper half of it, so our bounds on theta are going to start from zero, and then we'll go over to pi radians. So now I just have to convert the integrand. Well, x is just r theta, y is r sine theta, so y squared would be r squared 
sine squared theta. And that whole thing I'll put in parentheses because that whole thing has to be multiplied by r. So our first step will be to go ahead and distribute the r to both terms inside the parentheses. So now I have 3r squared cosine theta plus 4r cubed sine squared theta. So evaluating the inner integral, that means taking the partial antiderivative with respect to r, I'm just using a power rule. Cosine theta and sine squared theta are considered constants. So I'll get r cubed cosine theta plus r to the fourth sine squared theta. I'll have to evaluate that from r equals 1 to r equals 2. So that gives me 7 cosine theta plus 15 sine squared theta. Now let's remember, how do we handle sine squared theta in an integral? Well, we're going to use a trig identity for the double angle formula. I'm going to remember that cosine of 2 theta can be written as 1 minus 2 sine squared theta. So I can solve that for sine squared theta and get 1 half quantity 1 minus cosine 2 theta. So I'll go ahead and replace sine squared theta with that quantity and go ahead and distribute the 15 halves and now take the antiderivative with respect to theta. So antiderivative of cosine theta is sine theta. Antiderivative of 15 halves would be 15 halves theta. And the antiderivative of cosine of 2 theta, I'm doing a little u substitution in, in my head here. I know that's going to bring out a factor of 1 half. So I'll get sine 2 theta. But now instead of 15 over 2, I'll have 15 over 4. And then I'm going to evaluate that between 0 and pi. Well, this happens a lot in these uh, trig evaluations, where all of the trig terms evaluate to 0. Because we, a lot of times, have either multiples of pi here, or pi over 2. And so, um, sign of any multiple of pi, integer multiple of pi, is going to be 0. And of course, sine of 0 is also 0. So all of these sign terms evaluate to 0. And the only thing that's left is the theta term, which will evaluate then to 15 pi over 2. Here's another example. We're going to try to find the volume of a solid. It's bounded by well, z equals 0, meaning the xy plane. z equals 1 minus x squared minus y squared. So that is a paraboloid that opens downward. Its vertex is on the z-axis at z equals 1. And we're given that we're going to, uh, our domain of integration is uh, just the unit circle. And um, here's a, not a great picture of it, but it gives you an idea of what it is. And the uh, paraboloid actually intersects the xy plane at the unit circle. So we're really just looking at the volume contained under the paraboloid and above the xy plane. Now. You know, here's a case where polar coordinates is really, really useful. Trying to evaluate this uh, using uh, rectangular coordinates would be very challenging. In the end, you'd wind up having to use uh, probably a trig substitution. So you'd wind up using something that looks like polar coordinates anyway. So, and there's a lot of symmetry here. But there's, it's such an easy uh, integral to evaluate that it's really not worth trying to take advantage of the symmetry. So um, our volume then is, well, 
We're given the bounds, so let's go ahead and use those. 0 to 1 for r, 0 to 2 pi for theta. And what have I done here? I've replaced x squared plus y squared with r squared. And then multiply times r dr d theta. So I'll have to distribute the r as usual, and then take the antiderivative with respect to r, evaluate it between 0 and 1, and then that's just a constant. So uh, the value of a constant integral is just the constant times the difference in the bounds. So that would be 1 quarter times 2 pi or pi over 2. Well, we could also have more general polar regions besides polar rectangles. In other words, we could have the radius being bounded by an inner polar curve and an outer polar curve. In that case, then, it's something like a type 1 region, but for polars. So we're going to replace the bounds, then, on the inner integral with the uh, inner function as the lower bound and the outer function is the upper bound. And then, as always, when we're evaluating these iterated integrals, the outermost integral has to have constants for the bounds of integration. So let's make use of that. We're going to try to find the volume of the solid under the paraboloid z equals x squared plus y squared above the xy plane and inside the cylinder, x squared plus y squared equals 2x. All right, so let's try to get a handle on this cylinder. Uh, first, let's use rectangular coordinates. So x squared plus y squared equals 2x means x squared minus 2x plus y squared equals 0. And now I'm going to complete the square. I just need to add 1 to each side. And then I can factor that to get x minus 1 quantity squared plus y squared equals 1. So that's going to be a circle. The center is going in the xy plane is going to be at 1, 0, and the radius is 1. In polar coordinates, remember x squared plus y squared is going to be r squared x is r cosine theta. So I have r squared equals 2r cosine theta. And we're going to divide both sides by r. Remember, we should be careful about that. Um, but trust me, this works out. And so that would say that um, r would equal 2 cosine theta. So the formula for this circle is r equals 2 cosine theta. So now as a cylinder, that means that the z coordinate just varies over all real numbers. And so what this tells me is that my r value is going to be bounded by, on the top, by the equation of the circle and below by 0. So here's an image of what we're trying to look at. So this is the cylinder here in the, uh, so in 3D, centered here where x equals 1. Here is my paraboloid. And so what I'm interested in is the portion that's below the paraboloid, above that circle. That would be what's inside this cylinder. So my domain of integration is really that circle in the xy plane. But now I got to be really careful. When I have a circle in polar coordinates and the center is not the origin, we're so conditioned to think that, oh, once around a circle is 2 pi radians. That's true if the center of the circle is the origin. If the center of the circle is not the origin, well, we have to be more careful. So here is 
our circle in the xy plane centered at 1 comma 0 the radius is 1 and let's just plot some points on this circle we're just going to pick some values for theta and then find out what the corresponding value for r is and plot those points uh, and forgive me if my drawing is off a little bit uh, i think that some of my points are not exactly correct but you'll get the idea so the first one is correct because when theta equals zero cosine of zero is one so r will be two so i'm going to be starting here at two on the x-axis as theta increases say to pi over six um, then um, my radius would be well cosine of pi over six is root three over two so my radius is going to be root three so i'm moving in this counterclockwise direction around the circle as theta increases that makes sense let's go to theta equals pi over three i guess i could have done pi over four but let's just do pi over three uh, and then um, cosine of pi over three is a half so twice that will just give me one okay and when theta equals pi over 2, cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so now r is 0. So I've gone through half the circle, and I've only gone up to pi over 2. So let's go ahead and complete the circle with a few more samples. So 2 pi over 3 now, uh, my uh, cosine of 2 pi over 3, I'm in the second quadrant. Cosine is negative now, negative root I mean, negative one half, so I'll get a radius of negative one. So even though two pi over three is pointing out into the second quadrant, my radius is negative, so I move in the opposite direction. That's how I come up with a point in the fourth quadrant. And five pi over six, again, um, that would be in the second quadrant, the angle but I have a negative r value, so my point gets plotted opposite that in the fourth quadrant. And then when I'm back to pi, I'm back where I started. So when the center of the circle is not at the origin, you actually only go through pi radians in order to trace out the entire circle. So my bounds on theta go from 0 to pi, even though I'm going around the full circle. So be careful with that. All right, so now I've got the correct bounds. Now I just have to do the evaluation. Uh, what is, well, my integrand should be z equals x squared plus y squared, but x squared plus y squared is just r squared. So that's an easy substitution. Uh, and talk about challenging problems. This would be extremely challenging to try to do using rectangular coordinates. But here we're going to see it's going to be a fairly simple um, evaluation. We're just going to take the antiderivative now of r cubed. I'll get one fourth r to the fourth. I guess the, the only problem is, is that now when I replace r with two cosine theta, I'm going to get well, 2 to the power of 4 times cosine to the power of 4 theta. Well, 2 to the power of 4 is 16, so 16 divided by 4 gives me 4. So how am I going to find the antiderivative of 4 cosine theta to the fourth power? Well, let's go back to our uh, double angle formula. I can see that I've got a 2 cosine squared theta plus 1 here. So if I solve that for 2 cosine squared theta, that would be uh, cosine of 2 theta minus 1, and square both sides, I get my 4 cosine to the power of 4 theta. And then using FOIL, I would get cosine squared of 2 theta minus 2 cosine of 2 theta plus 1. 1. So let's make that substitution. Uh, I 
Okay, so I have to be a little bit careful there. Let me see here. So what did I do there? Oh, well, cosine squared of 2 theta. Oh, yeah, I need, I, I need to use this identity again. But now my, I'm replacing my, uh, doing a u substitution. I'm going to say u equals 2 theta. And using this identity with e cosine of 2u equals 2 cosine squared u plus 1. That's how I wind up having um, cosine squared of 2 theta as being half of cosine of 4 theta minus 1. And I can go ahead and remove the parentheses and collect the like terms. I'll have a minus one half plus one half. So then it just makes plus one half. So let's put that into my integral and then find the antiderivative with respect to theta. Remember, we're doing kind of a u substitution in our head here. We know that if I have four theta on the inside, that means when I take the antiderivative, I'll have a multiplier of 1 over 4. That's how I get 1 over 8 here. Same idea here. Um, actually, the antiderivative of 2 cosine 2 theta winds up being exactly a sine of 2 theta, but I still have the minus here. Uh, somehow, I have a mistake there. Don't I? I do indeed. There shouldn't be a multiplier here. Why do I have the one-fourth there? Because I made a mistake. So let's correct it. That's going to happen. In the end, it doesn't matter because when I do the evaluation, sine of 2 pi and sine of 0 is still 0. All right. So I'll have to continue to make that correction as we work this out. So one four. All right, but uh, yeah, the sine terms again, they're just going to evaluate to zero. So I'm only left with one half times pi minus zero, which gives me pi over two. Right. So uh, whether I'm using polar coordinates or not, we can find the area of a region in the xy plane using a double integral. All we do is we replace the integrand with 1. Because well, what am I really doing there? That's actually the volume of a prism whose base is r and whose height is 1. Uh, and since the height is 1, the volume is the same as the area of the base. Now, with our usual curves, it would just make sense to uh, use our, the techniques that we learned in Calculus 1 for calculating the area. But for polar regions, it might actually be easier to use a double integral than to use the calculations that we learned in uh, actually calculus two. So let's try to find it. the area of one leaf of the rows r equals cosine of two theta. So that's a four leaf rose. It looks like this. And so uh, we always have to be careful with these. Uh, so the idea would be We'd like to calculate the area in just one of these leaves. But the question is, uh, all right, I can say that my r is going to be bounded above by cosine of 2 theta and bounded below by 0. But what about the bounds on theta? So I'm going to uh, just. I do a little analysis here. So when theta starts at 0, r equals 1. So I'm at this point. So kind of the midpoint of that leaf. 
And what happens as theta increases? Well, as theta increases, uh, cosine of two theta will decrease. So R is going to get smaller. So I'm actually moving around the leaf in this direction until I get to pi over four, because two times pi over four would be pi over two. Cosine of pi over two is zero. So going from zero to pi over four gets me halfway around the leaf. And that's really good enough for me. Uh, if I can find an area of half the leaf, I just double it and I've got the area for the full leaf. So what happens after pi over four, I'm not going to be concerned about. I'm just going to use those bounds on theta, and that's going to give me the area of half a leaf. So to find the area of the whole leaf, which is what the question is asking for, I'll just take that and multiply it by two. So let's finish this up. Uh, antiderivative just r is one half r squared, but I had the multiplier two out in front, so now that's gone. Uh, evaluate that between zero and cosine of two theta. So now I've got cosine squared two theta. Great, let's go back and use our double angle formula. Cosine of two x is two cosine squared x. Cosine of four x would be cosine squared of 2x, because I have cosine squared of 2 theta here, minus 1. So if I solve that for cosine squared 2x, I would get half, in parentheses, cosine of 4x plus 1. So my integrand then will be half cosine of 4 theta plus 1. All right, I'll take the antiderivative with respect to theta. Uh, remember, this is kind of u substitution that I'm doing in my head will bring out a multiplier of 1 over 4 in front of the antiderivative of cosine, which would be sine. Uh, antiderivative of 1 is just theta. I've got the multiplier of 1 half out in front. And now evaluate it, and I can see, well, look, I've got 4 theta on the inside. I multiply that times pi over 4. It gives me pi. Sine of pi is 0. Sine of 0 is 0. And so I'm just left with pi over 8. All right, so in our last example, we're going to find area again. We're going to have two curves this time. We're going to have a cardioid. Remember, it's called a cardioid because its graph looks like a heart, kind of heart-shaped. And... Uh, outside the circle with r equals 30 cosine theta. So again, that's a circle where the center is not at the origin. So that should tell us, again, we need to be careful. So this is the shaded region. So the uh, magenta colored curve is the cardioid. And of course, the green circle is the other curve. And so we're trying to find outside the circle, inside the cardioid. It's those two. So we're going to use symmetry. We'll just calculate the area of one half of this. But I have to be really careful now. Uh, I'll start by finding the points of intersection. I can see clearly that the origin is a point of intersection of the curves. Um, but it's actually going to be kind of a stickler. Because if I solve, set my two r values equal to each other, I'll wind up with cosine of theta equals a half. And so theta is going to be pi over 3 or 5 pi over 3. And you might ask yourself, well, how come I didn't get this particular value here where r equals 0, right? Um, and the, the issue is, that as on the circle, as we go from pi over 3 to pi over 2, on the cardioid, I just move to this point on the y-axis. On the circle, I move down to the origin. So even though both of these 
uh, curves hit the origin, they hit it for different values of theta. And so what's the solution? Well, there's a couple ways we can approach this. One way we can say is that, okay, as I go from pi over 3 to pi over 2, I can find the area of this region, which I called R1. What about R2? Well, R2 doesn't have a boundary with the circle anymore. It's just bounded by the cardioid and zero. So the R values for the R2 region is, well, the upper bound is the cardioid, the lower bound is zero, and the angle that we're going through is from pi over two to pi. So here at, again, looking at R equals one plus cosine theta, when theta is pi over two, R is going to be one. When theta is pi, cosine of pi is negative one, so R is going to be zero. So as we go from theta equals pi over two to theta equals pi, we're going to be tracing out this portion of the curve. So we would be able to calculate the area of that region, R2. So I need to set up two double integrals with different bounds and different integrands. Different integrands? No, just different bounds. It's area, so the integrand is always one. So, but bounds, different bounds for theta and different bounds for r. So in region one, the outer curve is the cardioid, the inner curve is the circle, and we're going from pi over three to pi over two. We're multiplying it times two because we're going to have a region above the x-axis and a region below. And then for the second region, the outer curve is the cardioid. There is no inner curve, so we just say that the, it, r starts at zero. And then my angles go from pi over two to pi. So we're going to evaluate this, both these integrals, as we've done in the past. We'll first take the antiderivative with respect to r in the first integral and in the second integral. Replace our r squared with our upper bound squared minus lower bound squared. Do that in both integrals. Notice that I have 1 plus cosine theta. When I square that, I have to use foil. Uh, I can go ahead and collect some like terms, certainly in the uh, first integral. I would have a negative 8 cosine squared theta. So I'm going to go ahead and make our substitution. That's how I wound up with negative 4 and then in brackets cosine 2 theta plus 1. That was our using our trig identity. I'll use the trig identity for cosine squared theta in the second integral as well. Uh, now I'll have uh, some like terms that I'll want to collect in both integrals. And now I'll take the antiderivative with respect to theta in the first integral. Now I have to be careful with the bounds here because I'm used to saying, oh, I have zero to pi or something nice like that, and I don't have to worry about the sine term. But here I got to think about it. Uh, this one is more friendly because I have pi over two to pi and so the sine term in the evaluation is not going to make any contribution. So let's go ahead and work this out carefully. If I, in the first integrals, I always have this factor of two. Uh, so putting uh, pi over two in, replace, in place of uh, theta, that's just going to be three, negative three pi over two then. Uh, at least in this case, uh, sine of pi is zero. Now subtract off, I'm going to substitute pi over 3 in the place of theta. So 3 times pi over 3, that gives me pi, so I have negative pi. And then sine of 2 pi over 3 is good, would be a positive root 3 over 2. So I still have this minus, though, so it's root 3 over 2 with a 
minus sign. Uh, so now just combine that all together, combining like terms, and I'll get pi over 2 plus radical 3. And just one note, uh, there's another way you could have solved the same question, and that would be to say, well, uh, because, you know, it's kind of complicated with the bounds and the fact that they don't really have the same theta value at the origin. Why don't I just do this? Why don't I just calculate the area of this R1 region, which would just be the area between this line segment and the cardioid. I'm not even thinking about the circle. So I only have one curve to consider. I only have one set of angles to be concerned about. And so from pi over 3 down to pi. Then, in order to get the region that I want, what do I need to do? I need to subtract off this bit of the circle. This is actually called a segment of a circle. And so now when I evaluate this or find the area of this region, which by the way, I don't really need to use calculus for this, but we're asked to do it. So we would use the double integral because that's what the instructions say. Uh, but again, I'm only dealing with one curve. So again, each integral has different uh, bounds for both r and theta, but this uh, method might make more sense to you, and both of them are fine methods.